outstretched arms. You know, the outstretched arms of God can be many things that are very important to his children that love and serve him. God's outstretched arms can be a source of awesome strength to those that know how to call upon it. That kind of strength that assures you the victory over all of God's enemies, including Satan. God's outstretched arms can also be a source of comfort and healing. The kind of comfort that lets you go through this flesh life with confidence and peace of mind. God's outstretched arms can also be redemption and salvation to those of his children that reach out to him in return. That's an important key that I want you to come away from this afternoon with is that that's what's required. His arms are always reached out to you, but for you to tap into that source of strength comfort, redemption, and salvation, you must, in return, stretch your arms out to Him. You know, God's arms can also be a source of chastisement. And you know, but remember, always remember, God only chastises those that He loves. And when He chastises you, you best kiss the paddle, say, thank you, Father, straighten up your act, because there's work to be done. And he doesn't need a bunch of people that can't work with him. He needs people that can work with him. To do that, you have to be ready to do what he wants you to do, not what you want to do. As I said earlier, God's arms are always reached out to his children. However, there are those that would block God's children from reaching back to him with lies and false doctrine. Unfortunately, Many of those lies and false doctrine come from the very pulpits in God's house that should be teaching truth and showing God's children how to reach out to Him. They've become the very tools of Satan. I mean that. They have become the very tools of Satan. What should be Beth El, in the Hebrew meaning house of God, has become Beth Avin in the Hebrew, the house of vanity or the house of nothing. It's completely void of anything of God's word being taught there. Each of you has the opportunity, almost on a daily basis, to tear down those barriers of lies and false doctrine with what? What do you tear those barriers down with? Truth of God's word. That's what tears down those barriers. Each of you has the opportunity almost every day to reach out to your brothers and sisters that are in this world of darkness. They're lost. I mean, they are so lost, they have no idea which way is up in some cases. And you have a chance to share with them how to reach out to God. And again, tear down those lies and those barriers that block them. Teach them how to reach out. You know, I hear almost every week, I think I'm one of the elect but I'm not real sure. What is it the elect are supposed to be doing right now? Revelation chapter 7. There are four angels holding back the four winds from hurting the earth. What are they holding those winds back until? Until those that are supposed to receive the seal of God in their mind receive that seal in their mind. Is that just going to happen all on its own? I don't think so. It takes people like you and me talking to our brothers and sisters that are lost, tearing down those barriers, getting them into God's Word so that they can be sealed. We're going to start our our message today with Moses and Aaron having gone to Pharaoh. Moses told Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Let my children go so that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. What did Pharaoh say? Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey him? His voice. Get back to work. And to make matters worse, Pharaoh decided that if the children of Israel had time to wander off in the wilderness and hold a feast for three days, they didn't have enough work to do. So not only would they continue making bricks, but they would have to gather the straw to make those bricks with, which had been provided to them in the past. You will gather the straw for your bricks, 
and you will also continue to make the bricks at the same quota, not minus one, or you will be beaten. So the children of Israel complained to Moses, which, you know, that became not to be uh, too uncommon of a thing. They always seemed to be complaining to Moses. And Moses had to have been a real trooper, I'll tell you, because he caught himself between a rock and a hard place on many occasions between God and these rebellious children of Israel. But Moses heard the children complaining and he went to the Lord and he said, you know, why are you treating this people so evilly? It was you that told me to go talk to Pharaoh. I thought he'd just fall right in line and just let us go out in the wilderness and hold this feast you're talking about. You haven't delivered thy people at all, is what Moses said. What was God's response? Let's pick it up in Exodus chapter 6, verse 1. Second book in the Bible. And as always, we'll ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua's precious name. Chapter 6, Exodus, verse 1. Then, when? Well, it was after Moses said, Lord, you haven't delivered thy people at all. Then the Lord said unto Moses, Now shalt thou see what I will do to Pharaoh. The word I will appear 18 times in the next few verses. What is the number 18? Bondage. But he's about to bring his children out of bondage. Will I do to Pharaoh? For with a strong hand shall he let them, this being Israel, go. And with a strong hand shall he drive them out of this land. Not only will he let them go, he's going to drive them out of this land. Two. And God spake unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord. This phrase, I am, will appear five times in this revelation. What is the number five? Grace, that's right, that unmerited favor, that God's outstretched arms are always there for his children. Three, and I, Yahweh continuing, appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty. That's El Shaddai in the Hebrew. But by my name, Yahweh, was I not known to them. This is a little deceiving. It means that they really didn't perceive or understand that, you know, they knew the covenant name, Yahweh, but they didn't know it to the extent that they understood it. And not only did the Lord appear to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he'd also appeared to Moses, you remember? And when Moses was up on the mount on one occasion, he asked the father, he said, okay, Lord, I'll go down and tell these children what you asked me to tell them, but they're going to ask, who are you? What shall we call you? He said, I am that I am, which is the etymology, and you'll find that in the acrostic in Esther for the sacred name, Yahweh. Verse 4, and I have also established my covenant with them. You can consider this a contract to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, wherein they were strangers. And you know, out of all of those that came out, hundreds of thousands of them, the children of Israel that came out of Egypt, how many would eventually make it to the promised land? Only two, Caleb and Joshua. Verse five, and I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel. Not only do we have to continue making bricks now, we have to go gather the straw to make these bricks. And if we don't make as many bricks as we used to, before we had to go gather the straw, we get beaten, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage. And I have remembered my covenant. You know, he always does remember his covenant. He always remembers that contract. It's his children that forget. Verse six, wherefore say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will rid, this word rid in the Hebrew is not Saul, and it means to snatch. I will snatch you out of their bondage, and I will redeem you. I want you to catch this. How will he redeem you? I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments. This word redemption, check it out in your Strong's Concordance. It's, a, it's actually a legal term, and it means to exercise the rights of the kinsman redeemer. 
And remember, he is your closest relative. He is your closest kin. And you, and you can use this today. This, you know, a lot of people say the Old Testament. Or what are you doing back there in the Old Testament? God can redeem you today. This world has a lot of bondage that it places people under. Usury comes to mind. There's a bondage coming. The, the people claim to be Christians that have no idea what is going on in God's plan. And believe me, they are all set up to go into bondage. But you have that redemption right there with his outstretched arm today. Verse 7. And I will take you to me for a people, and I will be to you a God, and ye shall know that I am, there it is again, the Lord your God, which bringeth you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Verse 8. And I will bring you in unto the land concerning the which I did swear. And this word swear in the Hebrew is to lift up my hand, to give it to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And I will give it to you for an heritage. I am the Lord. And you know, a heritage, that's your inheritance. And I would ask you, have you claimed your inheritance? Now there are many types of, in the Bible, and I want to look at one other in Exodus before we leave there. But the point is, you have to reach your arms out to God. How do you reach your arms out to God? You reach your arms out to God through your prayers to Him, through obedience to Him, through service to Him. That's how you stretch your arms out to God. And I want to show you an example of that before we leave at Exodus. Let's go to 17.8. And of course, Israel would be uh, released from the bondage of Egypt. They, they, of course, in this period of time, they would have crossed the Red Sea. The Lord would have fed them manna in the wilderness. And uh, Moses just cooked his own bacon as far as making it into the promised land himself as we start here in the previous verse to where we're going to start with the rock of Meribah, which is written in Numbers chapter 20, verse 11. The Lord told him to speak to the rock to bring water forth when the children of Israel had no water. What did he do? He struck the rock and he said something to the effect, must we, referring to himself and Aaron, bring rock, water from this rock for you rebels? In other words, he was taking credit for bringing the water from the rock, not God. And he was supposed to let the children of Israel see this power of God and therefore they would have believed in him. So chapter 17, verse eight, and this is another problem that's gonna come up now. Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. Now, Amalek, of course, is the grandson of Esau. And as recorded in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 18, what had happened was Amalek, Amalek fell on the rear guard of Israel and had smitten some of the weak and feeble of the children of Israel. Verse 9. And Moses said unto Joshua, of course, Joshua, you know, in the Hebrew is Yeshua. And of course, he was a, a very type for Christ himself. Choose us out men and go out, fight with Amalek. Now, this would have been the first real battle that the children of Israel encountered after coming out of the captivity. So in essence, the very future of the entire nation was in jeopardy at this point, being attacked by the Amalekites. Tomorrow I, this being Moses, will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. And of course, this rod had already shown some miraculous powers, and, and the Lord working through this rod, and Moses and Aaron both knew it. And of course, when I read rod, I can't help but think about the rod that Christ will have in his hand when he returns, that rod of iron, verse 10. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, here we have the prophet, and Aaron, here we have a priest, and Hur, here we have one of the royal key, uh, king line, the seed line that, that David would eventually come through, went up to the top of the hill. And of course, Yahweh was there also. But at this point, there had been no miraculous uh, uh, intervention promised. So what's going to happen? Verse 11. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand. Now think of this as holding up both hands and both hands being on the rod. 
that Israel prevailed, and when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. There's an important lesson for us in this, as you'll see in a moment. When the enemy is prevailing, and you don't have your hands up to the Lord, you're not reaching out to him, you don't have the strength to prevail over the enemy. But when you are reaching your arms out to him through your prayers, through your service, through your obedience to him, that's when you have the strength to prevail against the enemy. Verse 12, but Moses' hands were heavy, the flesh is weak, and they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat thereon, and Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side and the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the morning, until the going down of the sun. So I want you to picture this. Here you have Moses sitting on a rock. On the one hand, you have Aaron holding up his hand, steadying it. On the other hand, you have her. You have the priest, the prophet, the king line. Does this position make you think of any position of outstretched arms that has to do with salvation? It might. Should. Verse 13. And Joshua discomfited, means defeated, Amalek and his people with the edge of a sword. And you know, there's uh, this again, anytime I think of the sword, it comes Revelation chapter 1. There's a two edged sword. And I think that Amalek also was representative of all the enemies of God at this point. I mean, this is the first one they're fighting, sure enough, but Amalek would always be, you know, from the beginning, Jacob and Esau. Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. There's a spiritual war continuing on today. And the, the, the winner will be the one with the two-edged sword of Revelation 1. I speak of Yeshua and the two-edged sword of his tongue, which is the truth. Verse 14. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book and rehearse it. This rehearse it means make it known in the ears of Joshua. For I will utterly put out, this means to rub out or erase, the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. Type for the lake of fire there, to be snuffed out or rubbed out forever. Why would God tell Moses, write this in a book? Obviously, he wanted Joshua to understand. You see, Joshua would be the one that would eventually lead Israel into the promised land and was one heck of a warrior. And what he is learning here, what God wants him to learn and not forget, is when you raise your arms out to God, you prevail against the enemy. You have the strength of God. If you don't raise your arms out to the Father, you're going to not prevail. In other words, you're going to get your tail kicked. And people often think, Boy, I'm ready to kick Satan's tail. I tell you what, if you try and take Satan on yourself, you are in a world of hurt. He is supernatural. He is going to have the ability to snap his fingers and make lightning come down from heaven. And if you're going to take him on yourself, you better rethink it because you need to reach your hands out to God. You have to have that strength to prevail against the enemy. And God wanted it written in a book for you also so that you wouldn't forget it. Verse 15. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Yahweh Nisi. And this in the Hebrew means uh, the Lord my banner. And he, he should be your banner. He should be your standard. Christ should be your standard. Verse 16. For he said, because the Lord hath sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. That war began with Jacob and Esau. It's a spiritual war. And it will continue until Ezekiel chapter 37 and Ezekiel chapter 38 are fulfilled. Who's going to be the winner? Yahweh is going to be the winner. And he can use some people, though, in accomplishing that victory. And there's work to be done today, as we'll see as we work our way on through this. But this war is going on, and my question to you is, which side are you on? Are you reaching your arms out to him to gather that strength that will give you the victory over the enemy? And I'm talking even Satan. 
There's another type that I want to pick up in Judges chapter 16. Let's turn over to Judges. Israel uh, was in servitude to the Philistines at this point, but a champion came out of the children of Israel. His name was Samson. Of course, Samson uh, was ordered to take the vow of a Nazarite from birth. Just before this, to where we're going to pick it up, he had slain 1,000 of the Philistines with a jawbone of an ass. Do you think he knew where to get the strength from? You know, a lot of Sunday school teachers say he got his strength from his hair. That's sad, you know what? I mean, that is really sad to be teaching children that someone's strength came from their hair. But let's pick it up in chapter 16, verse 1. Then went Samson to Gaza, and saw there an harlot, and went into her, went in unto her. You know, Samson liked the ladies. Uh, kind of reminds me of the leadership of our country at this point. <laughs> you know, he could conquer the Philistines, but he couldn't conquer his own lusts for women. Of course, Gaza, uh, those of you that don't know, would be one of the five major cities of the Philistines. Gaza means strong, and would it be as strong as Samson? Let's see, verse 2. And it was told the Gazites, these being the Philistines of Gaza, saying, Samson is come hither. And they compassed or surrounded him and laid wait for him all night in the gate of the city and were quiet all the night, saying, in the morning... When it is day, we shall kill him. Samson won't wait till morning. Verse 3. And Samson lay till midnight, and arose at midnight, and took the doors of the gate of the city. This word took would be better translated unhinged. He literally took the gates of the city and unhinged them. And the two posts, and went away with them, bar, this would be the locking mechanism, and all. We're talking heavy here, folks. I mean, the gate of the city, that was the main entrance into one of the five major cities of the Philistines. And put them upon his shoulders and carried them up to the top of an hill that is before Hebron. Uh, this is a Hebraism meant that the hill was in the direction of Hebron. Hebron, of course, would be in Judah, and we're talking a lot of miles, but this was uh, probably a place known as El Montar today and is about 45 minutes from uh, the city of Gaza in the direction of Hebron. There's an outstretched arm of Yahweh that you don't want to see. And I want to look at one example of that today. Let's turn to Jeremiah chapter 15, 1. fact is, let's go to Jeremiah 14.10. I want you to catch something here about why what happens in 15 happens. I tell you what, I hope you all, I, I'm feeling kind of like today, maybe one of those days when Paul was long preaching. Do you remember that? So I hope you all are ready for, we, we may uh, be here a while today, but I'll try and make it so interesting. You just can't hardly stand it. So, okay, here we go. We're going to do a little long preaching this afternoon, all right? We got time. Chapter 14, uh, verse 10 of the great book of Jeremiah. Thus saith the Lord unto this people, this would be Israel, thus have they loved to wander. This word wander can mean waver. And boy, have we, our, our uh, uh, relatives of the past, have wavered time after time after time. What have they wavered from? They wavered from our Father. They have not refrained their feet. In other words, they're walking around with the God, small g, of the heathen. 
They're sacrificing to their gods. They're not reaching their arms out to me, Yahweh. They're looking to the gods of these heathen tribes, these heathen peoples, for salvation. Would that make you happy if your children were looking to other gods for salvation? I believe I'd be kind of inclined to say, have at it, have a nice trip, as I've heard someone say quite often. Therefore the Lord doth not accept them. He will now remember their iniquity and visit their sins. This means charge their sins. Boy, are they going to get it unless they change their way. But that's some of those brothers and sisters we talked about early, that if you can reach out and tear down some of those barriers of the lies and the false doctrine, you've got a chance to, to pull them out of it. I mean, this is not irrecoverable. Irrecoverable, I can think I can say that. You know, as long as they can turn their ways, this can stop. Verse 11, Then said the Lord unto me, Jing Jeremiah, Pray not for this people for their good. Whoa, this is the Lord saying, don't pray for this people. This word pray can be translated intercede. So what is he saying? He's saying, you can't intercede for this people. Don't raise your hands to me on behalf of this people that has wavered and wandered away from me. They've got to raise their own hands to me. 12, when they fast, I will not hear their cry. And when they offer burnt offering and an oblation, I will not accept them, but I will consume them by the sword and by the famine and by the pestilence. In other words, even if they bring me an offering, it won't satisfy the debt. This sword, famine, and pestilence, I think, is in reference to Leviticus chapter 26. And this is the chapter where Yahweh would tell the children of Israel through Moses, you can do things two ways. You can do them my way, Yahweh's way, and receive blessings. Or, if you do it another way, you get the curse. These had chosen the curse. 13. Then said I, Jeremiah speaking, Ah, which is an exclamatory O, oh, Lord God, behold, the prophets say unto them, Ye shall not see the sword, neither shall ye have famine. But I, being this prophet, will give you assured peace in this place. These are the lies and false doctrine that we're talking about that block God's children from reaching out to Him. You've heard it before. You don't have to understand the book of Revelation. You're going to be out of here. This is, there's a rapture. I promise you peace. There's not going to be any tribulation. What did the Lord think about it? Then the Lord said unto me, The prophets prophesy lies in my name. I sent them not, neither have I commanded them, neither spake unto them. They prophesy unto you a false vision, a divination, and a thing of naught, and the deceit of their heart. Satan's tools from the very pulpits of God's house that should be teaching God's truth not false doctrine. Therefore thus saith the Lord concerning the prophets that prophesy in my name, and I sent them not. Yet they say, sword and famine shall not be in this land. Lies. By sword and famine shall those prophets be consumed. They are spiritually deader than a hammer. They have no idea, no concept of God's overall plan. They have been in the milk, milk, milk of salvation so long that they have no idea. And we're talking about false teachers of today here just as well as the false prophets of this time. And the people, what about the people that are listening to these false teachers? And the people to whom they prophesy shall be cast out in the streets of Jerusalem because of the famine and the sword. And they shall have none to bury them, them, their wives, nor their sons, nor their daughters, for I will pour their wickedness upon them. And let's jump to verse uh, chapter 15. And this again is the outstretched arm of the Lord that you don't want to see. Chapter 15, verse 1, still in Jeremiah. Then said the Lord unto me, Though Moses and Samuel stood before me, two of the greatest intercessors written of in the Bible, Moses and Samuel, even if they were standing here, talking to me on the behalf of these people, 
yet my mind could not be toward this people. This word toward would be, could be with or among this people. So not even Moses or Samuel could talk me at this point into me being with this people. Cast them out of my sight and let them go forth. And what this means is don't let them come before my face. Where was his face at this time? In the temple, of course, uh, the tabernacle. So uh, what he's saying here is don't, Tell them don't come with their words and their sacrifices because he had already told them, I'm not going to hear your words and your sacrifices won't pay the debt. Two, and it shall come to pass if they say unto thee, whither shall we go forth? In other words, you told us don't go into the, to the tabernacle of God with your words and your sacrifices. If we're not supposed to go there, where are we supposed to go? Then thou shalt tell them, thus saith the Lord, and this is really sarcastically said. He's basically saying, to your destruction, such as are for death to death, and such as are for the sword to the sword, and such as for are for the famine to the famine, and such as are for the captivity to the captivity. These false prophets were telling the people, I assure you, you will have peace. God's saying, I assure you, those that are for the captivity to the captivity. And of course, in this time, there are many that are in real danger of falling into a captivity that is very serious. That is the captivity of Antichrist. Three, and I will appoint over them four kinds. Spiritually on this, you could look at this as the four hidden dynasties. Think about it and check it out. Saith the Lord, the sword to slay and the dogs to tear and the fowls of the heaven, and the beast of the earth to devour and destroy. Verse 4, And I will cause them, this is his children, to be removed unto all kingdoms of the earth. Boy, has that ever come to pass. Because of Manasseh, Manasseh, uh, of course, in the Hebrew means forgetting, and he was one of the kings of Judah that really forgot who he was, uh, he shed innocent blood in Jerusalem. He even went to the point that he had gods of the heathens in the uh, tabernacle, in the temple of God. The son of Hezekiah, king of Judah, for that which he did in Jerusalem. Manasseh arguably being the worst or the most evil of the kings of Judah. For who shall have pity upon thee, O Jerusalem? Or who shall bemoan thee? Or who shall go aside to ask how thou doest? This last phrase could be translated to ask of thy peace. And there will be no peace until the prince of peace returns to Jerusalem. Thou hast forsaken me, not the other way around. You forsook me, saith the Lord. Thou art gone backward. Therefore I will stretch out my hand against thee and destroy thee. I am weary with repenting. I'm tired of pitying you. We've been through this time after time after time after time. And again, this is one arm or hand stretched out from God you don't want to see. Is it too late for him? Not at this point. Seven. And I will fan them with the fan in the gates of the land. This should bring to mind the winnowing fan. And the wheat will be separated from the chaff in the gates of the land. I will bereave them of children. In other words, I'll take away whatever they hold dear to them. I will destroy my people since they return not from their ways. There's the condition that will get them out of the situation that they're in. What is that? Return from their ways. That's all God wants. He wants them to reach their arms out to Him. Verse 8, Their widows are increased to me above the sand of the seas. They've lost their true husband. I have brought upon them against the mother of the young men. Bad, bad translation. Check this out. This should be the mother city. What is the mother city? Jerusalem. So if we read this the way it should be translated, against Jerusalem, a spoiler. The spoiler. At noonday, meaning what? It's unexpected. And boy, I'll tell you what, folks, you know, how can our brothers and sisters that don't even know that there are two Christ coming be anything but an unexpected time? 
If they don't know it's going to happen, how in the world could they know when it's going to happen? And I'm not indicating anybody should know exactly what hour, but we are to know the season. I have caused him to fall upon it suddenly and terrors upon the city. In other words, the false one is coming. It will happen. I mentioned earlier that there are those that block the outstretched arms of God's children reaching out to their father. And um, quickly we're going to go to, I know it's a scripture that you're all very familiar with, but it fits so well with this like a glove. I can't pass it up. Ezekiel chapter 13, verse 17. Verses 1 through 16 of chapter 13 deal with false prophets. Verses 17 through 23 deal with false prophetesses. But it also, I want you to pick up from this, this is what God thinks about those that try to cover up his outstretched arms. Verse 17 of chapter 13, Ezekiel. Likewise, thou son of man, this being Ezekiel, Set thy face against the daughters of thy people, which prophesy. We've got women, daughters here in prophecy, so we've got, we're talking prophetesses, out of their own heart or mind, and prophesy thou against them. You know, were there prophetesses of Yahweh? There certainly were. Miriam, Deborah, Huldah were true prophetesses of Yahweh. But there's one false prophetess that's probably one of the more recent ones. In 1830, Margaret MacDonald had what she herself described as an evil dream. And then she shared that information with two preachers. That was the origin of the rapture theory. 18. And say, thus saith the Lord God, woe to the women that sow pillows. And these you can think of as coverings to all harm holes, arm holes. In other words, they're sewing these coverings that cover the arms of people stretching out to the saving arms of Jesus Christ. Is that good enough? No. And make kerchiefs upon the head of every stature to hunt souls. It's not good enough that they're sewing coverings over the outstretched arms. They're also making hats that cover the eyes and cover the ears of God's children that they can't even hear or see those that would try and strip away this false doctrine and these lies. Will you hunt the souls of my people and will you save the souls alive that come unto you? Back to the old Tower of Babel. Man has always tried to create his own salvation. He thinks, you know, God probably really didn't think that through very well, this whole deal about Jesus Christ. So I I think, you know, we'll come up with this rapture theory and we'll just all be gone and that solves that. We don't have to really study Revelation. We don't have to study God's Word. We'll all be real happy and out of here. I think it makes God very angry. 19. And will ye pollute um, pollute me, this being the Lord, among my people for handfuls of barley and for pieces of bread? This refers to those that teach God's Word or hold, pretend to teach God's word, and the only reason they're doing it is for the money. You're polluting me, God says, by doing so. To slay the souls that should not die and to save the souls alive that should not live. They're too lazy to study. They don't even have the right to live. By your lying to my people that hear your lies. Only one way to salvation, that's through Jesus Christ. But all too many are taking on to this false doctrine, and boy, are they going to be in for a rude awakening. We can do something about that, beloved. We can strip away that, those lies and that false doctrine, those barriers. I think God expects it from us, more importantly. 20. Wherefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against your pillows. I'm against these coverings over my outstretched arms. Wherewith ye there hunt the souls to make them fly. And I, this is Yahweh speaking, will tear them from your arms and will let the souls go, even the souls that ye hunt to make them fly. There won't be a rapture. Just quickly look back at verse 5 of this same chapter. What's the subject? 
The subject is to stand on the Lord's day. Ephesians chapter 6, that gospel armor, you better have it on. You better know what I'm talking about. Because if you don't and you're trying to stand on the Lord's day, the first day of the millennium, and you're standing against the fiery darts of Satan, and you don't have your arms outstretched, outstretched to our Father through your prayers, through your obedience, through your service, that you can have the strength of the Lord behind you, you will fail against those fiery darts of Satan, I promise you. 22, or 21, I think it is. Your kerchiefs also will I tear and deliver my people out of your hand, and they shall be no more in your hand to be hunted, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. Some of you right now can be a part of that tearing of those kerchiefs. You can be a part of that. I think God wants us to. I think he expects us from it, Express, expects it from us. 22, because with lies ye have made the heart of the righteous sad, whom I, Yahweh, have not made sad, and strengthened the hands of the wicked. You've hurt the people that I didn't wish to hurt, and you've strengthened the hand of who? Satan, from the very pulpits that should be teaching truth. Strengthen the hands of that wicked. You could add wicked one to that. That he should not return from his wicked way by promising him life. They might even promise Satan life. You see that there? Ezekiel chapter 28. He's already been sentenced to death. He will die. 23. Therefore ye shall see no more vanity. Oh, what a great day. Can you imagine a day when there is no more vanity from the pulpits? that the truth of God's Word is taught and people have eyes to see and ears to hear. I look forward to that day. Nor divine divinations, for I, Yahweh, will deliver my people out of your hand. What was the first scripture we covered? Back in Exodus 6, do you remember? How does Yahweh redeem his people? With an outstretched arm. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. Well, you know, uh, I noticed this morning Pastor Murray was in the Old Testament all, all through the message. We're going to be in the Old Testament all through this message. But in conclusion, I want to go to a scripture that could have been written from the foot of Golgotha, the site of Christ's crucifixion, just as well as Psalms 22. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 52, verse 9 in closing. God said, your pillows and your kerchiefs will not prosper. They will not be successful. Why? Because he's going to tear them away from his children. You can be a part of that. Isaiah chapter 52, verse 9. Break forth into joy. Sing together. Whoa, whoa, sounds like there's something happy, something to be happy about here. I wonder what it is. Ye waste places of Jerusalem. They were wasted by the desolator, Antichrist. For the Lord hath comforted his people, he hath redeemed Jerusalem. Remember, he redeems with outstretched arms. Zion is restored here. Verse 10, the Lord hath made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations. Not only Israel, all the nations. That word nations, you know, means Gentiles. Has he revealed his arm to you? That, that arm, you know, being revealed, that's like a warrior rolling up his sleeve and getting his arm free for action. And all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our Lord. What's the salvation of our Lord? Yeshua. His outstretched arm. That's the Lord's outstretched arm to you and I. Yeshua. 11, depart ye, depart ye, go ye out from thence. We're talking about getting out of Babylon. We're talking about getting out of confusion. Touch no unclean thing. Go ye out of the midst of her, out of the midst of her. Be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. In other words, purify yourselves that bear the, the uh, vessels of the temple. 12, 
for ye shall not go out with haste, nor go by flight, for the Lord will go before ye, and the God of Israel will be your rearward. This rearward is a military term, which means a rear guard. Amalek won't be sneaking up from behind anymore, smiting the weak and the feeble, because Yahweh will be your rear guard. 13. Behold my servant. Now we're talking about Messiah. Shall deal prudently. He shall prosper and be successful, could be translated. Your pillows and kerchiefs won't prosper and be successful, because I'm going to tear them away. But my servant, Yahweh, Messiah, he will be successful and prosper. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Has that happened yet? Not here on earth, it sure didn't. He wasn't treated very well here. As many were astonished at thee, his visage was so marred, he was humiliated more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. You know, as they put that crown of thorns on his head and the blood ran down the side of his face and they made him carry his own cross up that hill of Golgotha. They spat upon him. He was humiliated. He was marred. 15. So shall he sprinkle. Check that word sprinkle out. Naza in the Hebrew. It means expiation. Atonement. Many nations, the Gentiles included, the kings shall shut their mouths at him. They'll be dumb in, in astonishment at him. For that which had not been told them shall they see, and that which they had not heard shall they consider. The Gentiles, you see, there's one group of people that have had a lot of contact from the Lord since the beginning. Most of them have chosen to ignore that. They have no idea who they even are. But here it's saying the Gentiles, who didn't even have the opportunity of all that, will see this salvation. Now then, chapter 53, in conclusion. Who hath believed our report? This report is doctrine or hearing. And the who here speaking is Isaiah and the remnant. And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Who has recognized that arm as the source of strength, as the source of comfort, as the source of salvation and redemption? I know you have. Two, for he, and the he here is we're uh, talking about Christ, shall grow up before him as a tender plant. The proud cedar of David has been chopped down, but from out of that stump, will come this sprig out of the root of Jesse. Out of the root of a dry ground. This dry ground is indicative of the condition of the world at this time. And he hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. But God manifested his outstretched arm from the beginning. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was God. And of course, you know who the Word is, the living Word. I hope you do. It's Messiah. Three, he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Peter, the founder of the church, even denied him three times. Peter swore he wouldn't do that, but even Peter denied him three times. Nobody was standing there with him when he paid this price. For surely he hath borne our griefs. He took our sins and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. They even went so far as he was, as he was hanging there on the cross to say, if you be the Son of God, come down from there. Save yourself. There were many, I'm sure, that looked upon him just as Job's friends looked upon him. Job, what in the world did you do to deserve this kind of wrath from God? You must have really committed some terrible sins for the Lord to be punishing you this way. That's the way the people thought about our Lord as he hung on that cross. What did he do to deserve this punishment? 
5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. Not his, our transgressions. This word wounded, too, can mean pierced. Think about it. As they pierced with a nail through his right hand, they pierced with a nail through his left hand. That was God's outstretched arms to the world. Even in his death on the cross. And I mean, it was a cruel death. But he still had his arms stretched out to those. He wanted to take those sins from the world to those that would believe. Let's see, we got wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And that, well, that brings to mind Genesis chapter 3, uh, verse 15, where God told the serpent, I will, bruise, you know, I will put enmity between thy seed and the woman's seed. You shall bruise his heel. And boy, did they when they put that spike through his feet. But I'll tell you one thing, there's some bruising of Satan's head that is going to happen, and I hope you all are a part of that. I'm sure planning on doing it. With God's strength, I'll add. The chastisement of our, let's see where we got to, wounded for our transgression and bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace or our well-being was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. And beloved, that's the only way man is healed. That's the only way to salvation are those outstretched arms. Remember, it wasn't his sins either. It was our sins. Why did he do it? He did it because he loves you. Six, all we like sheep have gone astray except for a few. This, by the way, at this point, I think is restored Israel after they realized the error of their way. But this is what they're saying about how they were before Israel was restored. We have turned every one to his own way, not God's way, to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Why did God lay that iniquity on him? Because he could cut it. He showed us how to live in this flesh. In Matthew chapter 4, when Satan tempts you, what do you do? You tell him to get out of your life. Better do it in the name of Jesus Christ. That's where the power is. Seven, he was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He did this voluntarily for you and I. Didn't open his mouth. He is brought as a lamb, think of the Passover lamb, to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. Every reference in the New Testament to the Lamb of God springs forth from this very verse right here. And all, everything that has to do with Passover in the New Testament springs forth from this verse right here. Eight. He was taken from prison and from judgment. Pilate even judged him. And who shall declare his generation? We will declare his generation. For he was cut off out of the land of the living. He was judged worthy of death. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. You know, God allowed it. In fact, as it was God. Emmanuel, what does Emmanuel mean? God with us. You know, he decided to do this. This was his plan of salvation. This was his outstretched arm to his children. And he made his grave with the wicked. Think about the two malefactors. And with the rich in his death. Joseph of Arimathea was a wealthy man. He went to the Romans and claimed the body of Christ as the kinsman redeemer. He placed him in a very nice tomb. Could this not have been written from the foot of Golgotha, I ask you? Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. I'll tell you what, there's one coming, though, that will have plenty of deceit in his mouth. That's the imposter and that flood of lies. Ten, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering, think of a sacrifice for sin, not his, ours, he shall see his seed. This is redeemed Jerusalem. He shall prolong his days. Revelation chapter 1, verse 18, Christ says, I am he that was dead, and behold, I am alive and liveth forevermore. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. 
It's the pleasure of the Lord to outreach His hand with that means of salvation. 11. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. 12. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, still speaking of Messiah, and he shall divide the spoil. Check out Colossians chapter 2, verse 15, where it states Christ spoiled the powers and principalities, the evil principalities and powers that we referred to a minute ago in, in Ephesians chapter 6. What does that mean? He defeated death. He defeated Satan. Hebrews chapter 2, the reason he came to this earth in the flesh, to defeat death, which is to say Satan. Because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Who are those transgressors? That's all of us. I don't know of one of us that wouldn't fit that category. To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? That's the way chapter 53 of Isaiah began, do you remember? It's been revealed to you. And I didn't mean for this to come across as a salvation message. I know you all don't need milk. You don't need salvation. What I meant for this to come across is Revelation chapter 7. Those four winds are being held by four angels. Until what? Until those that are supposed to be sealed with the word of God in their forehead, which is to say their mind, receive that seal. That won't happen as long as those people have kerchiefs, and hoods over their head where they can't see. You can be a part of that, tearing those away. And you know what? I don't want to compare this to, the, the, to Christ when he rent that veil from top to bottom, opening up for each of us to the Father. But what I'm saying is you can have just a big a part of helping one of your brothers and sisters that are lost in darkness to tear and I'm not saying that's like Christ tearing that veil. Don't misunderstand me. But you can tear those kerchiefs and those pillows. What do you do it with? You do it with truth. You do it by outstretching your arms. Don't forget to do that. Just, just because those outstretched arms mean salvation is one thing, don't forget they also mean that's your access to the strength of the Lord Himself. That's an awesome strength that you can tap into. Let's go to the Father. Yahweh, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your written word, Father. We thank you for your outstretched arm, that being Yeshua Messiah, Father. We thank you for allowing us to tap into your strength through the Son, through the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, giving us power over all of our enemies, Father, including Satan. Father, we know he is your enemy as well. Let us be a part of that battle, Father, as much as we can. We know that it's you, Father, that wins that spiritual battle. We know that you have those that serve you. Father, let us gain the wisdom, the knowledge of your word, which will allow us to be a part of that. In Yeshua, Jesus' precious name, amen.